Ever since I can remember, I have been obsessed with behavior. I needed to know why everyone did everything. So as a neuroscientist, I get to study the brain. And I think of the brain as the organ of who we are. More specifically, I study the activity of cells in the brain, neurons, which can make beautiful structures, such as what you see in green behind me. There, it's estimated that our brains have 100 billion neurons, which can make 100 to 500 trillion connections. That's really complicated. But it's a good thing because the world is really complicated, right? Our environment is noise and chemicals and lights, and we have things as complicated as language and as ambiguous as emotions. But that's our brain's job, to interpret the environment for us. So traditionally, it was thought that our sensory organs sample the environment, so light goes into our eyes, and then it gets relayed to the cool parts in the brain that help us think and make decisions. But I actually think that the sensory parts of the brain do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to decisions. And I think one of the most impressive things about the brain is how it can make predictions about future events. And I would argue perhaps one of the most important things to be able to predict is the availability of food. So how can I hear a kernel pop and expect this? Or maybe you're seeing a visual representation and maybe you have a specific expectation of the taste of salt. I can take this idea and train mice to expect taste. So in one experiment, I present a mouse with a smell and a sound at the same time, and then the mouse can lick a spout in front of its mouth and get liquid sugar. So the animal learns this really well. Sound, smell, lick, get sugar. I can then ask a couple different questions. So one, I can use licking to measure what the animal's expecting. If the animal licks, it's expecting to get sugar. If it doesn't lick, I infer that it doesn't expect anything. So I can measure what it thinks about the smell and the sound when they're together, and then what it thinks about the smell on its own and the sound on its own. So what we see is that when the smell and the sound are together, the animals lick a lot. But they also lick a lot to the smell by itself and almost never to the sound. This is weird though, right? Because they experienced both of these at the same time the entire time. Unfortunately, I did not discover this. It's a phenomenon called overshadowing. So here we would say that the smell has overshadowed the sound. But we've known about it for almost 100 years, but we don't know why. We don't know what in the brain is going on. So I decided to look in a sensory system. Since this is an expectation about taste, I'm going to look in the gustatory cortex, which is responsible for processing taste information. So this is a picture of half of a brain, so it would be looking at the front um, if the first third was taken away. So I can measure a neuron's activity by measuring its electricity. So I could put little tiny wires in the brain, and what you see in red is dye that was on the wires, and measure neurons' activity. So when I look at the activity when I present the animal with that learned sound and smell, almost half of neurons respond. And can I remind you, this is the taste part of the brain? I also see a lot of neurons respond just to the smell. This matches up really well when we look at what the animal was anticipating. And almost none of the neurons care about the sound. So maybe this is a good clue as to what the animal was learning. And I'd also like to tell you that these actually aren't the same cells. About a quarter of these neurons will only respond when the sound and the smell are together. So that implies that the brain has actually actively made a new representation to two different stimuli that were presented together. I think that's really, really cool. So I hope I got you excited about behavioral neuroscience, and I hope that I also showed you that our sensory systems are active participants in how we learn uh, about the world and how we engage in our environment. So I'd like to thank my mentor, Alfredo Fontanini, and my lab, and all of you for your attention.